This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the third video for Module 5. In this video I want to talk about the mole and how chemists use the mole. Scientists find it necessary to measure matter. We've done some of this in our class and sometimes scientists can measure matter by actually counting individual items or we may take the measurement of the mass of something or the volume. So someone doing inventory is going to want to count all those individual bolts in that bag to keep track of how many they are. Or professional chefs know that you get more accurate measurements on flour if you take a mass instead of putting it into a cup and trying to do a volume because flour particles will pack down and so the best recipes are based on using mass values. And then of course this familiar graduated cylinder shows a measurement for volume of a liquid. In measurement, we also often have names for particular numbers. You are familiar with a dozen eggs, which represent 12 eggs, but dozen is not reserved only for eggs. There are many things that be, can be called a dozen as long as you have 12 of them. A dozen donuts, um, you know, a dozen apples. We talk about having a pair of something, a pair of socks or three pairs of socks. In larger numbers, gross can be used to mean 144 of something. So these are general words that are names actually for a certain number. We also have names for a number that include a unit in the, the something that's being numbered. So a yard can be thought of as three feet, another unit within that larger size of a yard, or 36 inches. And a meter could be thought of as a thousand millimeters. And then, of course, if you're having to convert between units, you'll be using those techniques of unit conversion, also called dimensional analysis or factor label analysis, as you have to switch between different units so that your answer is expressed in the correct unit. Well, what does this have to do with chemistry and atoms? Well, we have to measure atoms in chemistry, but atoms are too small for us to measure individually. We can't count out individual atoms. We can't mass out individual atoms, at least not easily in the lab. They, certainly, there have been um, sophisticated tests that have led to some of the numbers we have, but so far as the ordinary chemist, that's beyond most ordinary chemists. And also that scientists are working with groups of atoms large groups because they're so small even taking a tiny pinch of something is going to give you a tremendous number of atoms. Remember also that we can use the word particle to refer to individual atoms or molecules of an element for the diatomic atom, or diatomic elements such as oxygen or nitrogen or as individual molecules of a compound. So the unit for measuring particles used by chemists and scientists of all type is a mole. This came from the original German word for molecule, which had that long O sound. So in English, we put an E at the end to remind us that we're going to say mole. But it actually is abbreviated as if it is molecule, so don't get confused, because M-O-L means mole, not molecule. The value for one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles, whatever it is we're measuring. And that is a huge number because, of course, when we're talking about atoms, we're talking about something so very tiny that you have to have a huge number of them to have enough to hang on to. The mole is also defined as the number of atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12. And this becomes very important when it comes to determining how we measure out a mole of any element because our measurement for the masses is actually a relative mass. So how does a relative mass work? I didn't mention in the previous video that atomic mass is a relative measurement, so I'm telling you now that 1 AMU was defined as 1 twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom. And again, this is a more complicated experimental procedure than we would ever do in class. As you move on in science, you might learn more about it. But basically, carbon-12, remember that very, very common isotope of carbon, nearly 99% of all carbon is this isotope, and it consists of six protons and six neutrons. So if you take one-twelfth of carbon-12, and remember again that electrons are so tiny we can pretty much discount them, 
So if you take 1 12th of the mass of 1 carbon 12, then you're going to get a mass that would equal 1 proton or 1 neutron because you have 12 protons and neutrons in there. And if you divide it by 12, then you're going to get what each one of them rep is masses. So that has become the standard for an atomic mass unit. And then the proportion between the atomic mass of carbon and the other elements has been determined based on this relative mass. So helium has a relative mass of 4, and it has 2 protons and 2 neutrons. If you compare carbon and helium, you'll see that the relationship between the mass of one atom of each is 3 to 1. And if you increase the number of atoms you have of each by the same, if you do a proportional increase, you double the amount of atoms of carbon and hydrogen, of carbon and helium, sorry, helium, if you double or if you triple the amount of atoms of carbon and helium, you still will have the same ratio. They will stay in proportion. So how does that concern moles? What's the thinking? So if going back to thinking about having one atom of each, you've got 12 atomic mass units compared to 4 atomic mass units, or a 3 to 1 ratio. If we change those AMUs to grams by multiplying it by the value for grams, which is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 24th grams in one AMU, if you multiply those out, you see, you know, essentially these AMU values will cancel. You're still going to deal with 12 to 4. You still have that 3 to 1 ratio. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking AMUs comparing carbon and helium or grams comparing carbon and helium. On a 1 to 1, 1 atom to 1 atom, you still have a 3 to 1 ratio. And that proportion stays the same if you just increase up. So instead of 1, if we have 1,000 atoms of each, then we have 12,000 AMUs compared to 4,000 AMUs, and that's 3 to 1. And if we multiply those AMUs times the gram value for 1 AMU, you still will have a 3 to 1 ratio. Therefore, if you have 1 mole, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of each, the ratio will still be 3 to 1. So if the atomic mass value of carbon in grams is defined as one mole. If 12 grams in the definition then equals one mole, then the atomic mass value of any element in grams is one mole. I've used helium here as to just as a test case to go through this calculation, but you could do the same kind of thinking with any of the other elements because carbon provided the standard for determining the AMUs and carbon is part of the definition of a mole, then the atomic mass value for any element is equal to one mole. The relationship between the mole and the number of particles it represents and the atomic mass number for any element is another reason that the periodic table is such an important tool for chemists. So not only in each of these squares on your periodic table do you have the atomic symbol for an element and a number of protons in the element, but this atomic mass will tell you two things now. Hopefully you know that it's going to tell you how many protons plus neutrons are present on, again, an, the average element, because if you take the atomic number 5 and subtract it from your atomic mass, it tells you how many neutrons are there. But it also then tells you how much you need to mass out if you want one mole of particles. So in the case of boron, it's 10.811, or depending upon the precision of your instrument, 10.8 grams. In that sample of that size, you will have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd individual atoms. When it comes to um, aluminum, measuring, massing out 26.982 grams would give you one mole. Or arsenic, 74.922 grams. So that there is a relationship between these atomic mass numbers and the number of particles that are found in that much mass that is a very helpful thing to know when it comes to predicting how much product you're going to make from any balanced chemical reaction. However, you do need to remember, if you are working with a diatomic atom or element, such as oxygen or nitrogen or all of these halogens, 
In the natural state, oxygen exists as a O2 molecule. It is two oxygen atoms bounded together, and that is the natural form of this element. So if you were to mass out one mole, and we'll just move this up to be 16 grams. If you were to mass out 16 grams, you would have one mole of individual atoms of oxygen in it. But in actuality, you only would have a half a mole of oxygen particles. And so I think this will become more understandable when we start working with actual uh, chemical reactions and calculating moles from those formulas. But just remember, when you're dealing with a diatomic molecule, the mass will give you only half the amount of particles because the particles exist as two atoms bounded together. Here are some examples of the amount the, you know, the volume, the visual amount of a particular element. So we have here one mole of zinc, 65.4 grams, one mole of carbon, of course, our standard at 12, one mole of magnesium, one mole of copper. So you can see the mole volumes are different because the size of individual atoms are different. Tin down here on the bottom is a much larger atom than carbon, for example. So 12 grams of carbon is compared to 100 and almost 119 grams of tin. And so there's a larger volume there. But the number of atoms in each of these samples is the same. Here are some compounds. And you can see, again, sodium chloride, only 58.5 grams in order to get that 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd number of particles but cobalt nitrate, we'd have 291 grams to get the same number of particles. So this whole idea of using a mole as a unit for a, a group of atoms, a certain size, a certain number of atoms, is something that's important in chemistry, and it's something that we'll be working with. And in the next video, I'll show you some calculations that you'll be doing with this concept.